not only does energy efficiency generate large environmental benefits, it often does, but there's also potentially really big financial benefits, right? Most obviously, if you're using less energy, your energy bills are going to go down. And so energy efficiency becomes not just about environmental goals, but also just finding ways to reduce these expenditures for low-income families that allow them to spend their money on other things that they might need to spend their money on, such as food or, or education or healthcare. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with The Ripple Effect. Well, Susanna, we know that you're very interested in the issues around climate change and inequality. How was it that this first came to be an interest of yours? So when I was younger, I spent a lot of time living in different countries, uh, including Sri Lanka, Egypt, Kenya, Costa Rica. Uh, so I've always been interested in trying to understand why, you know, there's huge differences in income, for example, across countries and, and within countries as well. So as I kind of became an economist, I was interested in trying to understand income inequality, uh, what policies might work for reducing poverty. And then more recently, kind of one of the most important issues for people living in poverty over the next several decades, and it's already starting today, um, or environmental issues or issues related to climate change or energy access and things like this. And so um, my research and my kind of policy engagement really lies at the intersection of poverty and, and trying to reduce poverty while also understanding environmental change that's happening. Why is it you think that that low income populations realistically are, are the ones that have become especially vulnerable uh, in, in the last couple of decades? Yeah, great question. So I think when we talk about low income populations, that's both, you know, the majority of people living in low income countries, for example, or middle income countries, but also here in the US, there's obviously uh, low income populations as well. And there's some things that you can identify that are pretty similar, even across what look like pretty different contexts. I think uh, one of those things is access to legal institutions, right? So if you uh, want to engage the government or engage other businesses on issues that you're having, um, having access or like recourse basically to, to address the issues that you're facing can be really difficult for low income populations. Um, things like financial access, access to the financial system, to financial infrastructure, things like credit, uh, which are kind of crucial if you're thinking about adapting to different risks that you might face. Low income populations tend to have much less access to those types of financial tools that might help them bridge uh, those types of risks. So I think those are some, some of the primary differences. Obviously, kind of like political influence or, or uh, political care or something, obviously, that, that people living in poverty tend to have much less of as well. And that can interfere with their economic growth and well-being. Well, that was one of the things I, I, I thought I should ask you is that to what level do you think that governments are looking at this issue and, and how much do they still ha have they missed at this point where they can really affect some positive change here in the future? Yeah, so when you think about environmentalism, it's really a classic case of a negative externality, as we would say in economics, right? Where some transactions happening between other people are affecting a third party that isn't engaging. And this is exactly where you want government intervention. So addressing a negative externality. And so environmental issues is really a key space where government regulation can really improve welfare for everybody, especially people uh, living in poverty who don't have access to you know, negotiations or financial tools, as, as, as we were just talking about. Um, and so I think governments are increasingly realizing the importance of this. Of course, they have lots of different incentives. They have political incentive, financial incentives. Uh, different governments will have different goals. But I think increasingly, as the science becomes overwhelmingly clear, governments are realizing the importance of addressing environmental issues by you know, implementing the policies that, that they're able to. But doesn't the public have to have a uh, the public in that region, I should say, have to have a say in, in this process as well. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, this is what democracy functions as, right? People, there's elections uh, for this particular purpose. Of course, uh, the electorate is also, uh, you know, or elections are often subject to financial forces, financial influences, especially in the U.S. That's the case, uh, as has been uh, discussed pretty frequently. Um, 
But I think as governments kind of are realizing that the majority of their populations are going to be affected by this, they don't have any other choice uh, but to address it and, and make sure that they are responding to the needs of uh, the electorate. So you talk a lot about infrastructure uh, and the component that potentially can be improved as we move forward. What is it about infrastructure that, that you focus on specifically? Yeah, so most of the research that I've done on infrastructure is on how large uh, banks or investors, so specifically things like the World Bank or the African Development Bank or the Millennium Challenge Corporation, how they invest in infrastructure, primarily electricity infrastructure, for example, um, and thinking about you know the effectiveness of those investments and also how you can provide oversight on investments. Often these investments are done by private sector partners, so you have public-private partnerships. How can you provide oversight in a way that is not excessively burdensome administratively, so not unnecessarily introducing additional bureaucracy or administrative burden? But of course, you don't want to provide too much discretion because then uh, you might worry about things like corruption or leakage where, where you're not sure where the funds are going. So trying to identify what are the best ways that you can provide oversight into how these funds are being spent, how to make sure that they're being spent in a way that effectively improves the economic conditions on the ground, uh, while still not unnecessarily overburdening these companies um, and you know, trying to find methods that are, you know, that still enable a smooth continuation of, of, uh, of the project. So you mentioned energy uh, a little while ago, and obviously there's lots of conversation going on around energy and pricing and, and, and yeah. more efficiency to try and find it in different uh, places around the globe. How specifically in some of the countries that you have visited is the issue of energy efficiency being addressed or, or to a degree maybe even not being addressed enough so that it really does have a positive impact on a lot of low-income families in, the, in those parts of the world? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think oftentimes when people hear the words energy efficiency, they think about um, you know conservation with the goal of reducing your environmental footprint, right? This could be the case for households in the US, even factories in the US or uh, you know factories that are using a lot of energy as well, but also in low-income contexts, of course. Um, and actually what some of my research has pointed out is that not only does energy efficiency generate large environmental benefits, it often does, but there's also potentially really big financial benefits, right? Most obviously, if you're using less energy, your energy bills are going to go down, right? And for many people and also for many firms, their energy bills can be a pretty substantial part of their expenditures for really low income families, both in the US and abroad. Um, they might spend more than 10% or even up to 20% of their income on energy related expenditures so that could be cooking or heating or lighting. And so energy efficiency becomes not just about environmental goals, but also just finding ways to reduce these expenditures for low income families that allow them to spend their money on other things that they might need to spend their money on, such as food or, or education or healthcare. Right. And that ends up being realistic in many cases, kind of a quality of life uh, issue as you as you're able to prove one side that helps uh, their life in general overall. Absolutely, yeah, exactly. And so, kind of documenting that first, like saying, okay, how can these financial savings benefit these types of families? Uh, the next question you might ask is, well, what are the barriers for adopting these types of technologies? And this is kind of going back to the financial barriers that we discussed earlier, uh, where often if you want to invest in energy efficiency. It might require a large lump sum investment up front. You know, if you think about refrigerators in a, in a store, the more energy efficient version might just be a lot more expensive than the standard one. And so if you don't have access to credit, you might just have to buy the cheaper one because, you know, that's the only cash that you have available on the day that you're buying it, even though, you know, over a two year period, for example, the total cost might actually be a lot lower for the energy efficient version because your electricity bills would go down so much. And so there's kind of, you know, the friction here is your total cost would be a lot lower, but low income families just don't have the upfront finances uh, to pay for it. And they don't have the credit to, to borrow, um, even though, you know, they could pretty well pay back the loan using the reductions in the energy expenditures that they've gained. Uh, so that's kind of an example of how a financial friction that's pretty common in a low income setting can prevent them from investing in energy efficient technologies that have both environmental benefits as well as financial benefits. Well, and, and you had done some uh, research uh, around uh, the adoption and use of cook stoves uh, in Kenya, which was a very interesting study. Give us a little bit of background on that. 
Yeah, so uh, the study that we did here was uh, on the Jikakoa charcoal stove, which is produced by Burn Manufacturing. They have a factory just outside of Nairobi. And uh, for the study, we worked with a thousand individuals living in low income areas in Nairobi. All of these individuals used charcoal cook stoves. And then we gave them the opportunity to adopt uh, the Jikakoa, this more energy efficient version. It's also a charcoal stove, so they're actually pretty similar. It's just that the Jikakoa is constructed using improved materials in a kind of modern factory. And so it uses much less charcoal to cook you know, the same meals. It takes less time to cook those meals. And so because people had to buy less charcoal, uh, that saved them a lot of money. Um, a lot of the existing research on cook stove has been done in rural areas. And so what we found in these urban areas is that charcoal is really expensive, right? If you live in a, in a rural area, often people gather firewood. Uh, obviously that costs time, um, but, but it's often free. But in urban areas, people are spending a ton of money uh, buying charcoal. And so there was these huge financial savings from adopting this more efficient charcoal stove. So were there, and I guess this is part of the decision process of people in some of these areas, of either staying with the old stove that they had or adopting with the new stove as well. Yeah, so that was kind of what we were trying to understand is how are people making that decision? What are the costs and benefits that they're weighing? Uh, and if there are people who want to adopt the more efficient stove, what are the barriers for them from doing it? And you know, more recently, there's been an emphasis on psychology in economics or behavioral economics, perhaps. People are focused on that sticker price up front, and they're not really thinking so much about the energy costs. You know, maybe if you're just spending a dollar a day, say on 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 energy, you're not realizing how much that adds up to, and that you would actually stand to to save a lot of money. Um, we actually didn't find that that was the case. It seemed, you know, potentially because if you're living in poverty, you're so aware of your financial expenditures, um, people didn't need to be reminded. And instead, we found that this uh, financial barrier, the upfront cost, was really uh, the big thing that was preventing people from from adopting it. Um, and so that's kind of the first uh, step. In the past few years since we did that study, there's been huge uptake of LPG, which is potentially even cleaner uh, than charcoal stoves. We're not currently studying the LPG, but I think it's important to recognize that that adoption is kind of one step in potentially many steps. You know, And in the US, you're then seeing the next step, which is going from gas stoves all the way to electric stoves as well. But But did the public in your study, the people that you worked with, did they was it even a thought process, uh, you know, as they were thinking about which stove to adopt about the potential benefits that they could get down the road? Or was that not even really in their in their thinking in the here and now? So that's why we ran kind of a randomized experiment. And so of the thousand people that we worked with, we randomly assigned them to two groups. One group was the group control group. So the comparison group, basically. And the other group. Uh, we actually went through a whole kind of accounting exercise where we walked uh, through how much they would save on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. What would you do with these savings? So we did that for a whole year. So we said, okay, next February, you might save, say, $15 in your charcoal expenditures. What are you going to do with that money? Maybe you're going to buy more food, et cetera. So we really uh, worked hard to emphasize just how much money they would save from adopting the stove. And then after we did that, we can compare that group with the control group where we didn't do all those reminders and we can compare the rates at which they bought the improved stove. And we really didn't see any difference there. So doing all those reminders really didn't have any impact. So from that, we can conclude that it seemed like people were already pretty aware of these long term uh, benefits. What then do you think is kind of the future in terms of focusing uh uh, more longer term on the issue of inequality in and around climate change? So I think one of the key defining characteristics of climate change is risk and uncertainty. This applies for you know, low income households who may not know what types of weather is going to be realized. They might rely on the agriculture that they produce for to, to feed their own homes, their own households. Um, so from kind of the poorest farmers that you can think of, all the way to the largest corporations in the US, right? Risk and uncertainty, especially associated with climate change, is one of the defining characteristics, even of why we have financial markets. And so I think in order to address those risks and that uncertainty, um, evolution of financial tools, for example, insurance or savings or new types of technologies that allow people to kind of better leverage these different types of financial to tools um, could be potentially really crucial in enabling households and firms 
to respond to these risks and uncertainties that climate change is uh, is causing. So seemingly, there's already a lot of focus, it sounds like, in around the insurance industry, using that as an example of the issue of risk and what you're going to need to see in the future. So this is a process that it sounds like it's ongoing, but will will eventually get better over time. Yeah, I think so. I think as uh, especially private sector players, you know, for profit companies are realizing how important it is to uh, factor in these types of risks and uncertainties into their daily operations. You're seeing a recognition of that. And as a result, more development of financial products that could help with that. And, you know, as those products are being rolled out, often initially in Europe or the U.S., um, you know, then we also want to understand how can we bring these products to even lower income uh, country. So I think one of the great recent innovations on this has been a shift from indemnity insurance, where, you know, somebody from the insurance company has to evaluate what damages you incurred in a certain storm, um, a shift towards parametric insurance, which basically just says, if there was a storm that was near where you live, you're going to get a fixed payout. And so that redu- that really changes the accounting and the economics of insurance. And so we're trying to understand how exactly that changes the take-up decision, how it influences people's ability to uh, mitigate the risks, and also how we can get that product um, you know, available to low-income families in low-income countries. So probably like a lot of areas right now, uh, the focus around the data that you need to make a lot of these decisions is going to be important to that process as well, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, one of the key things is you know, different parts of the world will have huge differences in how much risk they're facing. Um, and so trying to understand, you know, the exact risk over time uh, is, is one of the key things that you might want to do. There's a huge increase in data availability over the past 10 years, you know, satellite imagery, administrative records. Um, there's always a tension, I think, uh, where on the one hand, you might um, want these types of administrative records because it's really representative. It doesn't rely on um, asking people questions or trying to, you know, telling people or asking people to respond to surveys and such, but actually looking at how people actually make decisions, you know, how many people took up insurance, how many people chose to invest in a certain savings account or something like that. So getting those administrative records can be really useful. I think increasingly researchers are benefiting from those types of data sets. Um, At the same time, you want to be really concerned about confidentiality and privacy and, and making sure you're doing this in a way that's uh, anonymous, respectful of what people were intending to do with their data. So there's definitely a tension there um, between, you know, the quality of the research that you want to do and also respecting the privacy concerns that that people have uh, justifiably raised. So how is this impacting the research, not only that you've done in the past, but where you want to take this in the future? What are the areas that you seemingly are, are focusing on right now that are, are kind of on your radar for the next several years? Yeah, so I think um, the really the interplay with financial decision making. So I have some some ongoing work on how people make financial decisions, how people perceive risk and uncertainty when they're choosing how much to save or how much to consume uh, in the context of climate insurance as well, uh, in the context of energy efficiency adoption. Um, and then I'm also, of course, pretty excited about Wharton's new ESG initiative. As part of that, they launched the Climate Center. So there's faculty, um, not just in economics, but also from Uh, real estate, from finance, from accounting, lots of faculty from across Wharton who are working on climate related issues. We just launched that last year. And so I'm pretty excited to see what is going to happen with that initiative over the next, you know, five to 10 years or so. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.